the field of pathological narcissism and narcissistic abuse is besieged, absolutely besieged, <laughs> by self-styled experts, charlatans, and outright con artists. But there's one field, one topic, where the pervasiveness of nonsense is even much higher. And that's the topic of autism spectrum disorder. Watch this video as an antidote, an orientation, a guide to what we truly know about this family of disorders. The video is divided in two parts because I'm Jewish. The first part is recent discoveries about autism spectrum disorders. And the second part is a general introduction, clinically founded, evidence-based general introduction to autism spectrum disorders, starting with etiology, differential diagnosis, how to diagnose uh, autism spectrum uh, disorders, and so on and so forth. So general introduction, second part, and recent advances, discoveries, um, the first part. And who am I to tell you all this? My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm a professor of clinical psychology in Cambridge, United Kingdom, Ontario, Canada, and an outreach program in Lagos, Nigeria, CIAPS, Commonwealth, for Commonwealth Institute of Advanced Professional Studies. I am also the author of the first book ever about narcissistic abuse, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. And I'm mentioning this because one of the chapters in Malignant Self-Love was the first to suggest, as far as I know, I may be wrong, but among the first to suggest that there is a link between pathological narcissism and autism spectrum disorders, at the time Asperger's. So the book was published in 1995. That's almost 30 years ago. Yes, I'm that old. <laughs> I know I look much older. <laughs> okay, Shoshanim, Chavivim, Kapsonim, etc., etc. Let's delve right into autism, my favorite subject next to none actually next to narcissism. Autism spectrum disorder is, as I said, the domain of a tsunami of nonsense, misinformation, disinformation, rumors, and conspiracy theories. And we start with one of them, vaccination. In 1998, someone by the name of Wakefield, <laughs> uh, sounds like a, a figure from a, horror, a 19th century Victorian horror novel, Anyhow, Wakefield published an article in 1998, I think it was in Lancet, where he linked autism spectrum disorders with the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. The, this paper that was published in 1998 spawned, created a huge conspiracy theory online. Unfortunately, in 2010, Lancet retracted the article. Retracting an article means the article was wrong. Lancet cited, politically correctly, <laughs> cited flaws in the study, but also said that two of the claims in the study, two major claims in the study, have proven to be false, which is a very, very strong language implying extensive fraud in the data set. Regrettably, this has been too late. By now, for several decades, everyone and his dog and his mother-in-law became experts on autism spectrum disorders and propagated the nonsensical myth that autism has something to do with vaccination. Now, there have been several population studies and we failed to find any association between childhood immunization and the development of autism spectrum disorders or even related neurodevelopmental conditions. So, unfortunately, that's wrong. There's no connection. Now, autism spectrum disorder generally manifests in early childhood and it is a neurodevelopmental disability. In, in other words, it is essentially a body-based disorder, reminiscent of, for example, uh, bipolar disorder, 
reminiscent of schiz schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. There's a very powerful, very strong corporeal body element, not only mind. Autism spectrum disorder is hard to diagnose. We're going to discuss it in the second part of the video, where I'm going to criticize the most of the practices involved in diagnosing autism spectrum disorder. But generally, it is typified, it is characterized by unusual communication skills, which is a way of saying that autists are non-communicative, or when they do try to communicate, they sound weird. Qualitative abnormalities in social interactions and restricted, repetitive, stereotypical patterns of behavior, activities, or interest, a laser focus, some kind of obsession or rumination on highly specific things, highly specific people, highly specific ideas, concepts, interests, or behaviors. Some say that autism also involves what is known as concrete thinking, which is more typical of psychotic disorders. But okay, it's it's been mentioned before. Now, autism spectrum disorders, it's, it's plural, yeah? It's because it's a group of conditions. It's a family of conditions. And they can be divided broadly into two groups. Genetic disorders with features of autism, for example, Rett syndrome, and what we call idiopathic forms of autism, autism, standalone autism. Very often, we are not quite sure as to the etiology of idiopathic autism. In other words, we're not quite sure of the cause, what made it happen. In the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illnesses, 5th edition, text revision, non-genetic autism spectrum disorders have subs this category has subsumed four previous diagnoses in the fourth edition of the DSM. So for example, Asperger's disorder became level one autism spectrum disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, pervasive developmental disorder, and uh, developmental disorder not otherwise specified. They all became now, they are all known now as autism spectrum disorders and their levels, level one, level two, and so on and so forth. More about all this in the second half of the video. So if you want to learn in-depth clinical data information about autism spectrum disorders, fast forward to the second half. You would be breaking my heart, but you know, I deserve it, <laughs> according to most of you. Now, what are the most recent discoveries? Number one, autism spectrum disorder is somehow correlated with the ages of the parents, ages of mommy and daddy. When mother and is older than 40 to 49 years or younger than 20 to 29 years, especially if the mother is older than 50 or younger than 20, there is an enhanced chance of having an autistic offspring. Similarly, and very interestingly, if there is a big difference in age between the parents, there is an increased risk for autism spectrum disorder. This has been confirmed in multiple studies. Now, there's a lot of hoo ha, -ha, -ha about um, substances, substances that induce autism spectrum disorders, especially if they are consumed by the pregnant mother. I will mention one of them, and later in the, later in the first half of the video, I'm going to discuss others. The most prominent um, substance that features both in scholarly articles and in conspiracy theories, ironically, is zinc. There's been a meta-analysis that found evidence of lower concentrations of zinc in patients with autism spectrum disorders, but there is no evidence. So this is the clinical part. That's the evidence-based information. The conspiracy theory is that zinc from underground water or from groundwater creates autism. There is no evidence of this. No ev evidence linking the levels of zinc 
in groundwater to the levels of autism or prevalence or in incidence of autism spectrum disorder in pediatric patients. Next, language. Bilingualism, monolingualism, and polylingualism. Children who speak one language or are exposed to one language during their developmental, during the developmental stage, the formative year, years, children who are exposed to two languages and children who are exposed to multiple languages. Does this have anything to do with the emergence of autism. Now, there was a scoping review that found that bilingual children in, in uh, at the time it was in Greece, uh, bilingual children with autism are not disadvantaged compared to monolingual peers. Actually, they enjoyed some benefits, the typical benefits of bilingualism. And there was a systematic review, pretty big one, and they reached similar conclusions for multilingual environments. They found that there is no negative conclusion. We can draw no negative conclusion regarding these environments and many patients with autism instead benefit from such a setting. How about exposure to screen time, especially very early childhood exposure to screen time? There's a study <laughs> about this. There's a study about everything. So. There's been a meta-analytic study. It's a study that studies studies. It's a study that aggregates other studies and derives conclusions using statistical methods. So there was a meta-analysis and it found insufficient evidence of an association between exposure to screen time or the length of exposure to screen time and autism. There was a, what, what, what is called a negative summary effect size, a negative summary effect size in the studies. So there's no proof, in other words, at this stage at least, there's no proof um, linking, connecting exposure to screen time, laptops and iPhones, television even, to autism. But here's something that we are beginning to find out is absolutely true. Sleep, sleep disturbances are linked. The correlation is very high, they are linked to autism spectrum disorders. There's a meta-analysis that try to clarify the differential relationship between specific sleep problems, core sleep problems, and behavioral problems in patients with autism. And what they found is that restrictive and repetitive behaviors were significantly, significantly correlated with sleep onset delay, the inability to fall asleep, and also with sleep anxiety. Children who had difficulties falling asleep and were anxious about it displayed much more restricted and repetitive behavior, or many, many more restricted, restrictive and repetitive behaviors. And I would venture to suggest that we should study the link with anxiety Restrictive and repetitive behaviors in autism may be anxiolytic. The aim of these behaviors may be, it's speculation on my part, may be intended to reduce incipient anxiety. The study also found that total core autism spectrum disorder symptoms were correlated with total sleep problems. Daytime sleepiness was not significantly associated with autism core symptoms, but it was moderately correlated with affective anxiety symptoms, which is why I suggest that anxiety is the mediator here. And we should study whether some autism core symptoms are not actually intended to reduce, ameliorate, mitigate, and control anxiety. In other words, they are not, they're not forms of self-soothing, maybe restrictive behaviors, Repetitive behaviors, stereotypical behaviors, are just forms of self-soothing intended to reduce anxiety. Anxiety linked in this particular study to sleep, but I think more generally even. Daytime sleepiness is commonly observed in clinical practice, and the pre but the prevalence of this among children with autism spectrum disorder is a whopping 15%. And finally, social communication problems, 
were not significantly correlated with any specific sleep problem, for example, bedtime resistance. There's other research that confirms that children and adolescents with autism have more sleep problems than peers without autism. Sleep is definitely connected somehow. Could be that the sleep problems themselves are induced by underlying anxiety and that autistic behaviors are intended to catch two birds with one autistic stone to resolve two problems with a single set or type of behaviors. In other words, repetitive, stereotypical, restrictive behaviors may aim to reduce anxiety and to help the child to go to sleep, to induce sleep, to be soporific. Okay. Another well-established connection is between eye movements and autism, which raises the very intriguing possibility that EMDR, a form of cognitive behavioral therapy, which involves eye movements, maybe EMDR would be effective with autism. It's not been tried rigorously yet. But at any, at any rate, be that as it may, there is a connection between eye movements and autism. There was a study that substantiated the fact that eye tracking biomarkers accurately identified autism in young children. And so this became or is becoming a kind of diagnostic battery, diagnostic tool. Other research substantiated it and supported the use of eye tracking technology in early screening for autism, coupled with artificial intelligence, machine learning techniques to analyze behaviors and biomark biomarkers, but still the, core, the, the, main, the main pivot, the main element or foundation of the, of the, of the diagnostic um, protocol is tracking eye movements. Recent research confirms that primary care pediatricians are as capable as, of diagnosing autism spectrum disorders as experts. They may have less, less confidence in their diagnosis, but they're as capable of doing this, especially if they use the eye tracking method. And again, I'm reminding you, we have an eye tracking therapy, EMDR, not yet applied widely and rigorously to autism, and maybe it's about time. What's the contribution of the parents? In the second half of the video, I'm going to discuss the discredited and very wrong idea of refrigerated mothers. Mothers whose absence, emotional absence, inability to nurture, allegedly caused autism in their children. This has been discredited. It's not true. I want to make clear. Dead mothers, as Andre Green calls them, dead mothers, metaphorically, do not create autism. They are not part of the etiology of autism. They don't cause autism. But for a while, for about 20, 30 years, we did believe this. So what is the role of parents? Several recent studies found that parent implemented interventions or parent training help the parents to manage the child's irritability. Irritability is a, a very problematic uh, trait or clinical feature of autism in autism spectrum disorders. And it seems that parents can help with that. There's been a mega meta-analysis that found that parent training alone among non-pharmacologic approaches achieved this outcome of controlling irritability as well as monotherapy with drugs or medicines. In other words, it was a perfect substitute to medication. There was another meta-analysis that found that parent-implemented interventions were effective for pediatric patients with autism spectrum disorder. And this was true, this proved to be true in a variety of circumstances and environments. The, uh, the imp these interventions by parents, trained parents, their interventions improved not only maladaptive behavior, such as irritability, but also, for example, language and communication, positive behavior and social skills, 
and to some extent, adoptive behavior and life skills. So, yes, the parents do have a role, and it's the exact opposite of what we used to believe in the 1940s. They can help. Okay, I promised you to discuss a few outliers. I mentioned zinc. What about omega-3 fatty acids? There's no evidence of this. There's, there's been a few hints, a few wisps, a few speculations, but there is little evidence that supports the, the belief that the consumption of omega-3 fatty acids improves somehow autism spectrum disorder or even behaviors such as irritability. So it seems that interventions uh, with omega-3 fatty acids went nowhere. However, I mentioned parent, parental interventions. And parental interventions include, for example, reading to the child. Reading to the autistic child improves phonologic awareness. But even so, there's no evidence that reading to the child alone can manage irritability. What about acupuncture? So I'm discussing now the outliers, the speculative attempts to find ways to manage clinical features of autism that went nowhere, speculations that went nowhere. And I mentioned fatty acids, I mentioned reading interventions, acupuncture. There is very low quality, non-rigorous evidence that somehow attempted to link body acup acupuncture and modern acupuncture technology uh, to, the, to improvements in, so, in the social functioning of autistic children. There's no evidence for skull uh, acupuncture, acupuncture here on the head, but body acupuncture was linked somehow. But the studies are beyond reprehensible. And I, having read them, I tend to feel comfortable and confident to say that acupuncture is not effective, definitely not effective in managing specific behavioral facets uh, of, of uh, um, autism, such as irritability. Maladaptive behaviors are not affected by acupuncture. What about probiotics, probiotic supplementation? There's been some research on this and it compared daily probiotic supplementation and intranasal, um, so daily probiotic um, supplementation with intranasal oxytocin spray, alone, in combination, and so on and so forth. What the study found is that patients receiving the combination treatment, probiotics with oxytocin, improved several indices, several indexes of autism. For example, they improve their autonomy, what, what is called autonomic indices. Autonomic indices are body, bodily. So for example, heart rate variability uh, is an auto autonomic index in autism spectrum disorder. And a combination of probiotics and oxytocin allowed the subjects, allowed the patients with autism to control or to better manage some autonomic indices, for example, heart rate variability. Um, other, other research indicated that probiotics alone uh, might help relieve behavioral and gastrointestinal symptoms for patients with autism. There was other work that suggested that intranasal oxytocin taken as monotherapy, enhances neural sensitivity and improves results, uh, overall results for people with autism. So what I'm trying to say is that we are far from any conclusive, uh, conclusive evidence, but there are promising signs. And also we're beginning to understand that the intestines, our guts, are as important as our brains in regulating mental health conditions. And I have a video dedicated to the role of the gut or the role of the intestines 
in regulating and promoting and, uh, mental health and in generating mental illness. So clearly probiotics should have some impact. We're not yet sure what it is. So these are the recent, most recent developments in the study of autism spectrum disorder. And now, as promised, the second half of the video, I will give you a general introduction to autism spectrum disorders. We're starting with etiology. Etiology is co causation. What causes autism spectrum disorders? In the 1940s, there was a series of papers which at the time were considered to be seminal. The papers were written by Leo Kanner, K-A-N-N-E-R. And Kanner suggested that autism spectrum disorders resulted from rejection of the infant by emotionally called parents, especially the mother. And he coined the phrase refrigerator mother. Bruno Bettelheim, a bit of a con artist <laughs> in his own right, but a brilliant genius otherwise, in the 1950s and 1960s, popularized this idea and it became very, very influential. For, so for three decades, the community of psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists and social workers believed firmly that it was the mother's fault if her children turned out to be autistic. This was a gross injustice because it is absolutely not founded on any clinical data or experiment or study. It's an infuriating case of charlatanism. Kanner was a charlatan and so was Bettelheim in this particular case. Since then, there have been numerous studies, family studies, individual studies, and so on and so forth, and this hypothesis, which has never been substantiated in any way, shape, or form, this hypothesis has been utterly, thoroughly disproved and discredited. The, the development of autism spectrum disorders in children has nothing to do with faulty, bad parenting. It's a myth, a nonsensical myth, as nonsensical as the myth that autism is caused by vaccination or vaccines. Now, of course, parents feel guilty when their children turn out to be defective somehow. And adding to that by saying that the parenting style of the mother has caused the autism really created a major mental health crisis among mothers and fathers of children with autism spectrum disorder. Here's the fact. The causes of autism spectrum disorder are unknown. I repeat, we do not know what causes autism spectrum disorder. End of story. Anyone who tells you otherwise is either ignorant or a con artist. We don't know. There are as many hypotheses as I have socks, and I have many socks. So, obstetric uh, complications, infection, genetics, toxic exposure, none of these has been established as a definitive etiology. No studies, no proof, no evidence. There are many factors associated or correlated somehow with autism spectrum disorder, including, as I said, maternal and paternal ages, the difference between the ages of the mother and the father, Caucasian or Asian race of mother and father, college graduation of mother and father, and so on and so forth. But these are tangential correlations. They are not really causative. And because these are not randomized trials, but observational, they are not rigorous and they should not be taken seriously. Now, I'll review some of the more resounding hypotheses, the hypotheses that you can find in textbooks and so on and so forth, starting with obstetric, obstetric complications. Many individuals with autism spectrum disorder and other neuro related neurodevelopmental problems did experience uh, 
problems in the prenatal and neonatal periods, and especially during delivery. There is a high incidence of such problems in the etiology and the anamnesis of patients with autism. But it's not clear if there is causation. It's not clear whether the obstetric, obstetric complication caused autism or whether the obstetric complications and the autism were caused by a third factor, for example, environmental problem of some kind, drug consumption, alcohol consumption, and so on. During the perinatal, perinatal period, factors associated with the risk of autism are hypertension or diabetes in the mother, threatened abortion, antepartum hemorrhage, cesarean delivery, gestational age of under 36 weeks, parity of over four, spontaneous labor, induced labor, no labor, bridge presentation, preeclampsia, fetal distress, you name it. During the postnatal period, factors associated with the risk for autism include a low birth rate, uh, weight, postpartum hemorrhage, male gender, and brain anomaly. Uh, by the way, to the best of my knowledge, no one has studied the possible linkage between postpartum depression and autism spectrum disorder. But it's an interesting um, thing to explore. In a very large Danish study published in JAMA, uh, the maternal use of valproate, uh, which is a medicine uh, used for used to treat epilepsy, uh, migraines, and bipolar disorder, it seems that the use of valproate during pregnancy was associated or is associated with a significantly increased risk for autism in the offspring. So we are beginning to learn that certain medications consumed during pregnancy are correlated and sometimes strongly correlated like valproate to autism in the, the newborn in the child similarly exposure of a mother to ssris antidepressants uh, particularly during the first trimester may increase the risk that her offspring will develop autism spectrum disorder Thyroid problems are also in the mother are also associated with the risk of having a child with autism. That was a pretty large study, actually, more than 5,000 women and 4,000 children. So there is no debate and there is no denying that problems with the mother's body, metabolism, exposure to substances, problems with the gestation, the pregnancy, problems in the environment within her body, problems in delivery, problems post-delivery, postnatal, are all definitely linked to the emergence of autism spectrum disorder. We just don't know how, and we don't know if there's a third cause, something that causes both, and we are not quite sure if these are critical factors or contributing factors, sufficient or necessary conditions. But autism spectrum disorders, as I said at the very beginning, are bodily, the body related. So evidently, anything that affects the body might have an impact on the, on the formation and the genesis of autism spectrum disorders, the, the pathogenesis of the disease. Infection, for example, there's been there there've been a few in the last few decades. There've been a few cases, a few scholars who suggested that there is an infectious basis for some cases of autism spectrum disorder. A large number of children born with autism are born to women who contracted rubella during pregnancy, for example. So the hypothesis that infections infections trigger some vulnerability to the development of autism in the fetus is not entirely crazy, not entirely inane, should be studied. 
uh, more deeply. What about familial factors, genetic factors, hereditary factors? If autism spectrum disorder is a body thing, and other body issues such as schizophrenia, such as borderline personality disorder, such as psychopath uh, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathy, such as bi bipolar disorder, whenever the body is involved in the genesis or pathogenesis of mental illness, we find a hereditary, a pronounced hereditary genetic component. Is autism the exception? No, it is not. Familial factors influence the risk for autism, the rate of autism in children born into families that already have a child with autism spectrum disorder is as high as 19%. The risk is twice as high in children born to families with two or more children of autism. In other words, they have a 40% chance to develop autism. Girls born to a family that has a child with autism have 2.8 times the risk of having such a disorder, a neurodevelopmental disorder. Very, very strong, there's very, very strong evidence that autism spectrum disorders are hereditary. Twin studies have demonstrated that there is a degree of genetic heritability for autism spectrum disorder, with the environment making a substantial contribution to the development of these conditions in the study subjects. That's very intriguing. It seems that autism, perhaps like narcissism, autism is a predisposition. It is genetic, it is inherited, but what is inherited is the predisposition. And then somehow the environment triggers the predisposition, expresses, causes the genes to express. And the environment could be the mother's body during gestation. The environment could be postnatal events. The environment could be toxic chemicals. Things in the environment somehow trigger the genes responsible for um, autism spectrum disorders, somehow cause them to express. It's nurture and nature in collaboration. And I have a strong suspicion that this is precisely the case in pathological narcissism, by the way. Multiple family studies suggested that there, there are genetic components in many cases of autism spectrum disorder. So we know, for example, that asymptomatic first degree relatives of some probands with autism have abnormalities in serotonin and other chemicals similar to the probands. Um, and we have been trying very hard, especially in the past decade, to somehow locate the array of genes which would give rise to autism. Finding the genetic base for autism. Hitherto we have failed, but it's a very interesting failure. It's a failure that contains the seeds of success. Of success. So for example, factor analysis of data sets from the Autism Genome Project suggested some kind of linkage of a joint attention factor between some gene called 11q23 and a repetitive sensory motor behavior factor with another gene called 19q13. So the, what, I, what this means is that clinical features and elements of autism can be traced back to highly specific genes or to gene arrays which are somehow linked they work together, they are connected. A third of monozygotic twins are concordant for autism spectrum disorder. Dizygotic twins are concordant for, concordant for autism at, the, at rates of 4 to 8%, which is comparable to siblings. So clearly monozygotic twins are much more susceptible to autism than dizygotic twins, which are comparable to normal siblings. Again, proof positive, the genes have something to do with it. A focused neurogenetic evaluation of children with autism yields a genetic disorder in two-fifths of the children. It's huge, by the way. In, in most genetic studies, we get a much lower result. Mutations in the gene Shank 3 
are associated with autism very strongly. And there is this story of the fragile X syndrome. It's a, it's a kind of autism spectrum disorder. It's a subtype. And it can be identified through genetic testing. Antagonists to metabotropic glutamate receptors can reverse the symptoms in mice, at least, with fragile X syndrome. And there's another type of autism known as tuberous sclerosis. It's a disorder with specific genetic mutations. And there's a lot more. Um, this is not a seminar. That's an introduction. I've mentioned that I believe, or the indications are, that there is a predisposition to autism, which is somehow triggered by the environment. And among other things, I mentioned toxins, toxic exposure. Exposure to toxins, chemicals, poisons, and other substances. This has been hypothesized for a long time now as a cause for autism spectrum disorders. Roberts and Samson reported an association between exposure to the organochlorine pesticides um, and uh, during the first trimester of pregnancy and subsequent development of autism spectrum disorder. So it seems that pesticides or some types of pesticides induce autism to a level that the correlation can be safely established. Potential mothers are advised to avoid, of course, these. In parts of the world, exposure to specific toxins may influence local rates of autism spectrum disorder. For example, there's a very high incidence of autism in areas of Japan. And when we try to see what is different in these areas, why the population of the cohorts in these areas are prone to autism, we discover that these areas and these areas only consume a highly specific fish with a toxin. This, this fish contains a toxin and they consume the toxin. Now, toxins may play a role in the development of isolated cases of autism in Japan, but we have yet to prove that they are generally causative of autism in Japan or anywhere else. Another possible explanation, for example, for this high rate of autism in Japan is the excellent training of Japanese clinicians. They're among the best in the world in diagnosing autism. Maybe low rates in other countries is because the clinicians there have limited abilities to diagnose autism spectrum disorders. Now, there are studies that connect or link autism spectrum disorders to air pollution. In North Carolina, for example, there was a study that linked exposure to traffic-related air pollution, particularly during the third semester, to the development of autism spectrum disorder in offspring. And these results add to the evidence already provided by previous studies conducted, in this case, in California. And there was a study of children living in counties in Pennsylvania and they found that children with autism were 1.4 to 2 times more likely to have been exposed to higher levels of air pollution, especially chromium and styrene and so on and so forth, during pregnancy and in the first two years of life. So these children were twice as likely to have autism spectrum disorder. Cyanide, methylene, chloride, methanol and arsenic are also linked or were linked in studies to autism spectrum disorder. I mentioned parental age already. Um, epidemiological studies have shown that ASD risk in offspring increases when the age of either parent is 35 years or older or higher. Sandin and his, and his collaborators reported that after controlling for parental age, the adjusted relative risk for autism was 1.52 in the offspring of mothers aged 35 years or older compared to mothers aged 25 to 29. By the way, this applies equally well to mothers under the age of 20. Haltman and his uh, collaborators found that after controlling for maternal age, offspring of men aged 50 years of old or older were 2.2 times more likely to have autism than offspring of men aged 29 or younger. 
I mentioned vaccination at the outset of this, uh, of this video, and now let's discuss the diagnosis of, of autism spectrum disorder. Can we really diagnose such a fuzzy neurodevelopment, allegedly neurodevelopmental disorder? We don't know what causes it. We don't know what to link it to. We're not sure about anything. I mean, how can we safely diagnose it? And how can we tell it apart from dozens of highly similar conditions, as we will see in a minute? The criteria for diagnosing autism spectrum disorder are included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, text revision, and in International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, 11th edition, ICD-11. So the DSM and the ICD, both of them agree that there is such a neurodevelopmental disability called autism and that it is a spectrum, and that there are multiple disorders, related disorders, in a kind of family. But the criteria for autism differ in the DSM and the ICD. They're not the same. So clinicians and researchers are comparing apples and oranges, <laughs> which is a major problem when we use statistics to try to figure out or ferret out relevant information. The differences in the criteria for autism spectrum disorders and related conditions in the DSM-5 text revision and the ICD-11 in other nomenclatures is a major problem. The criteria are presented uh, in ways which render these disorders arguable, if not incompatible. Generally speaking, the description of autism spectrum disorders, and by the way, other childhood developmental and neurodevelopmental disorders and other child pathologies, psychopathologies, but especially autism spectrum disorders, in both the DSM and the ICD-11, DSM-5 and ICD-11, the, the description is very poor, ill-substantiated, speculative, and very problematic. They do not fully describe, for example, the concepts incorporated in the criteria for autism and related conditions. So an inexperienced clinician is likely to incorrectly apply the criteria for autism <laughs> because it's so fuzzy, so ill-defined, so vague. The diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder in the DSM-5-TR text revision has two key criteria. Number one, impairments in social communication and social interaction. <laughs> vague, as it, as vague as they come. And a restricted repetitive range of interests, behaviors, and activities. That's more specific, much more specific. But regrettably, it's common to dozens literally dozens of other disorders, some of them genetic, some of them neurodevelopmental, some of them mental, some of, as we will see. Clinician experience, therefore, is super critical here because the, you cannot rely on the diagnostic text. The diagnosis of autism and related conditions is very, very problematic and relies crucially on the personality, exposure, and experience of the diagnostician, which is bad. It means it's not a clinical entity. That's bad. And everyone and his mother-in-law are diagnosing autism. Pediatricians, clinicians, therapists, psychiatrists, social workers, you name it. They slap this label on, on children the same way they slap the label of ADHD. The same way people today slap the label of narcissism on everyone and his dog. It's a problem. It's a problem because delayed diagnosis of autism and related conditions may hinder the chances of treatment. If, if the diagnosis is delayed and treatment is, is not initiated early on, the likelihood of a favorable prognosis, favorable outcome, is much reduced. And so we have 
what are the tools that we have except the clinician's experience? <laughs> One in a hundred. What are the tools that we have? Not much. Start with screening, screening tests. There are procedures available for diagnostic screening, including what is known as the checklist for autism in toddlers or CHAT. And there's a modified CHAT, M-CHAT, and quantitative CHAT, Q-CHAT, the CHAT family. <laughs> the problem with CHAT is that quite a few of the items in this test are strongly culturally biased. <laughs> but I mean strongly. It's like a test written by white middle class men in, in the West. Um, it can be applied probably in some parts of the United Kingdom, not all, and maybe some parts of the United States and Canada. I think that's about it. There's a need to adapt chat, this tool, and need to adapt it to specific cultural settings. Cross-cultural adaptation is crucial. The three items of chat that are highly predictive of the development of autism spectrum disorder are proto-declarative pointing, gaze monitoring, and pretend play. And even babies engage in these behaviors in the presentation, in the stage, in a stage called presentation, which is essentially observing infants and toddlers. They engage in this, in these behaviors. And so this core of three behaviors, pointing, gaze monitoring, and pretend play, they're faking as if they're playing, but actually they're not socially interacting. These are strong indications that autism spectrum disorders should be further investigated. Motor, motoric skills, self-care skills, clumsiness, sensory issues should all be observed as well. But we need a standardized test to assess sensory processing difficulties. And so, you know, this is a problem. We don't have a really good sensory processing measure. We don't have anything that can cope aptly and amply with the short sensory profile of children with autism. And we cannot therefore construct a sensory profile for infants and toddlers in any meaningful or rigorous way. I mentioned culture. Culture is a problem. When you evaluate children, cultural considerations are paramount. For example, there are cultures and civilizations and societies where eye contact is forbidden. So gaze monitoring would fail in these cultures. The way people play or avoid playing with each other, social interaction, pragmatic use of language, they're all culture bound. They're all highly specific, sometimes within a region, not a country even, a region, a state, a county, a city. So we need to take this into account especially when the family's primary language is not English. And all the tools we have are in English. We have serious problems in, in diagnosing um, autism spectrum disorders because the overlap of the clinical features of autism with other diseases is infinite, literally infinite. Differential diagnosis is near impossible. So I can read to you a list of dozens, dozens of disorders uh, that can be easily mistaken, even by experienced clinicians and diagnosticians, can be easily mistaken for um, autism spectrum disorders. They include physical problems such as infantile hydrocephalus. They include genetic problems such, uh, such as interstitial deletion of uh, certain genes. They include language disorders. They include all kinds of diseases such as, such as Minamata's disease or Mobius syndrome or uh, non-ketotic uh, hyperglycinemia. Epilepsy. They include 
uh, disorders such as Tourette's syndrome, trisomy 22, um, lead poisoning. I mean, it's it's uh, it's mind-boggling. The number of disorders we have to rule out before we reach a conclusion of autistic spectrum disorder is ginormous and it includes very common problems such as anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, attachment disorder, congenital rubella syndrome, uh, down syndrome, failure to thrive, uh, physical child abuse, I mean, Rett syndrome, Williams syndrome, I can continue. Someone has made a list of 100 conditions that we should rule out before we diagnose autistic spectrum disorder. And who is doing this? No one. There is a serious probability that the vast majority of children and people, adults, diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder actually do not have autism spectrum disorder of any kind. They do not have a neurodevelopmental disorder. They have something else. And that's a very sad and sorry state of affair. Now, it's not that we are totally helpless. We do use some instruments developed to diagnose um, autism spectrum disorders. We use these tools, uh, if we know how to use them, in a reliable and valid way. <laughs> Uh, experience matters, as I mentioned, and experienced clinicians usually can immediately identify deficits, particular deficits in children with autism. Um, but we can't rely on a clinician's experience and intuition. <laughs> this is not this is not medicine. This is not this is that's that's witch doctoring. That's quackery. It's, it's not serious. And when we try to become serious, for example, there's been there have been studies of metabolic abnormalities, and we identified some metabolic problems in people with autism spectrum disorder, but we couldn't find any biological markers, and and so it went nowhere. We tried neuroimaging. There's no clinical evidence to support the role of neuroimaging in the diagnostic evaluation of autism spectrum disorder. None. Even when there are abnormalities in the brain, for example, megalens megalencephaly or megalencephaly or similar disorders, even then, uh, neuroimaging is not very helpful. The results are inconsistent. Uh, but we couldn't find a diagnostic. We couldn't come up with a diagnostic finding. What about electroencephalography, EEG? It's useful for ruling out, for example, seizure disorders, um, acquired aphasia with convulsive disorder, the Landau-Kleffner uh, syndrome, biotin-responsive infantile encephalopathy, and so on and so forth. So EEG is used to rule out some, a few of the hundred <laughs> similar conditions, but it cannot be used to diagnose autism. So we are reduced to psychophysiologic assessment, to observing the child or the infant or the toddler or the adult. We observe. <laughs> we, there's nothing else we can do. Nothing objective. Nothing quantifiable. We just observe. Um, how, how do people breathe? I'm kidding you not. Response habituation in respiratory periods. Um, uh, electrical electrical conductance or electrodermal activity in, in the skin uh, vasoconstrictive peripheral pulse amplitudes and and so on and so forth we're trying to we're trying to isolate stimuli the very very same technique is used in polygraph in light detectors and that's why they're not not admissible in court they're not reliable we know, for example, that children with autism spectrum disorders, some children, display auditory overselectivity, but only some. Others don't. What about polysomnography? Uh, most children with autism spectrum disorder, as I've mentioned, 
experience sleep disturbances, early morning awakening, frequent arousals, fragmented sleep, and you name it, poor kids. So we could, we could study this. Um, children with autism display prolonged sleep onset and abnormal sleep architecture. Polysomnography um, can somehow be useful in identifying sleep disorders or even in demonstrating seizure discharges. But can it tell us that someone with a sleep disorder also suffers from autism spectrum disorder? No, of course it can't. And what about genetic testing? General guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology and the Child Neurology Society recommend genetic testing. High resolution chromosome studies, DNA analysis, fragile X, uh, chromosomes in, and so on. They say in their guidelines that it could yield us, uh, lead us to identify autism spectrum disorder in children. But this is very misleading. Only children who fulfill highly specific diagnostic features, only children with highly specific clinical features can be diagnosed with genetic testing. For example, only children with an intellectual disability that cannot, be ex that cannot be excluded. Only children with a family history of fragile X or undiagnosed intellectual disability. Only children with dysmorphic features. How many, how many aut autistic children have all this? A fraction, a tiny fraction. It's useless. Genetic testing at this stage is useless. What about neuroimaging? MRI. MRI has been applied, of course, to patients with autism spectrum disorder, but the results were inconsistent, and I'm being very charitable. Inconsistent. There were typical findings, of course. There was enlargement of the total brain, the total brain tissue, and the lateral and fourth ventricles, along with reductions in the size of the midbrain, the medulla oblongata, the cerebral, the cerebral, the cerebellar uh, hemispheres, and vermal lobules, um, six and seven. Okay, so we found these features, these brain abnormalities in many children with autism spectrum disorder. The problem is these features exist also in children with no autism, without autism, non autistic children. For example, vermal hypo hypoplasia is found in some individuals with, AS with ASD. Uh, and vermal hyperplasia is identified in others. <clears throat> the volume of gray matter is bilaterally decreased in the amygdala, the percutaneous and the hippocampus of people with ASD. Adolescents with ASD have shown greater decreases in the volume of the gray matter of the right precuneus than adults. The volume of the gray matter in the middle inferior frontal gyrus has been found to be slightly decreased, increased, I'm sorry, with people with autism. So yes, there are all kinds of abnormalities, statistical abnormalities, by the way, increase, decrease is a very relative term. So imaging studies of people with, or patients with autism spectrum disorder, who, for example, exhibit headbanging, show enlargement of the dipolic space in the parietal and occipital bones, loss of gray matter, and so, uh, with these bony changes. So, but that's to be expected. Maybe it's nothing to do with the autism. It has to do with the headbang. Okay, same applies to diffusion tensor imaging, to computed tomography, to SPECT single photon emission CT scanning, to N, Ironically, the oldest, the oldest technology of all, EEG, is useful for ruling out several uh, neurological and neurodevelopmental disorders and narrowing the field so that autism becomes much more likely. But globally speaking, neuroimaging is not helpful, simply not helpful. And I mentioned already that genetics is not helpful, neuroimaging is not helpful. The dirty secret of uh, autism spectrum disorder. 
is that it depends, your diagnosis depends on the clinician. Your likelihood of receiving a diagnosis which is wrong is exceedingly high, actually, unless you're willing to pay a fortune, not small fortune, to be investigated by the number one clinician in the field, or number two, someone with vast experience. So, there are several research directions I mentioned. We are studying mutations. This mutations may explain the search, uh, and may explain uh, the commonalities between several neurodevelopmental disorders. We are studying metabolic abnormalities. Uh, we try to find uh, autism biomarkers through next generation sequencing, omics, omics platforms, proteomics, metabolomics. metabolomics. Um, maybe there's early age disease biomarkers. We don't know yet. Beyond the brain, we're studying the role of other organ systems. Um, so gastrointestinal system. There are the quite a few studies taking place now. Uh, many, many individuals with autism spectrum disorder also report gastrointestinal dysfunction of some kind. It might be mediated psychologically. It might be some biological connection. We don't know yet. Um, estimates of the prevalence of GI gastrointestinal disturbances within the autistic population vary among studies, but they range between 20 and a whopping 86%. Gastrointestinal dysfunction is more prevalent among individuals with autism than among non-autistic individuals. There's no debate about this. The severity of gastrointestinal abnormalities is correlated with the severity of the autism. There's a potential role for the gastrointestinal system as a modifier of ASD behavior and a factor in ASD ideology. We're studying this abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, gastroesophageal reflux, uh, we're studying all this, the connection to autism. To summarize, more than 100 years after a Nazi Viennese doctor came up with Asperger's, we are still very, very, and I could add another very far from knowing the first thing about autism spectrum disorder to the point that there are scholars who doubt the very existence of autism spectrum disorders. The same way other scholars doubt the existence of dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder. It's a contested group of neurodevelopmental disorders. And it's related so intimately and intricately to other kinds of diseases that unless we find clear objective biomarkers, clear metabolic pathways, clear neurological pathways, a clear etiology. Um, we're going to continue with a vague, equivocal, fuzzy, prone to speculation and conspiracy theories uh, discipline, which is the study of autistic spectrum disorders as it is today.